Good day. It's a pleasure for me to lead this discussion today. Sound quality does not allow for interpretation at this time. Service will resume as soon as possible. Aujourd'hui, on accueille un panel d'experts pour réfléchir ensemble au chemin qui s'offre à nous pour peut-être revoir un peu l'usage des données au service du bien commun et le rendre accessible à tous. Euh, car finalement, est-ce que ce n'était pas la promesse des données ouvertes Alors, je vais présenter euh, les différents intervenants. Je les présenterai tous avant qu'ils parlent. Ils vont parler chacun leur tour pendant une douzaine de minutes. Euh, donc, il y aura Jacques Priol, Jacqueline Liu et euh, Stéphane Roche. Euh, et on aura une période de questions à la fin. Donc, euh, je vous invite à mettre, entre autres, dans le chat public, euh, vos questions. On va les regarder puis on utilisera euh, celles qui sont les plus pertinentes pour, 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 pour poser aux panélistes. Euh, donc, je le répète, posez vos questions dans le chat, ça nous fera plaisir d'y répondre. Alors, pour commencer le panel, on va se tourner vers Jacques Priol, qui est en France, euh, et qui notamment euh, va se baser sur l'état des lieux des données ouvertes en France et les conditions de la circulation et du partage de données entre acteurs publics et acteurs privés, et il va explorer et qu'il explore avec différentes collectivités françaises. Euh, Jacques est particulièrement bien placé pour aborder ce sujet. Euh, en plus de diriger le cabinet le Conseil Civitéo et l'Observatoire d'État public, il a conseillé plusieurs villes euh, dans leur stratégie de gestion des données et en plus de ça, écrit plusieurs livres sur les données et les villes intelligentes. Jacques Priol. Bonjour, euh, bonjour à tous. Je suis ravi euh, de vous parler euh, depuis la ville de Nantes, en France. Et je vais commencer. Okay, everyone. I'm delighted to speak to you today. I'm in Nantes, in France. I'm not sure if you can see these slides. Here we go. You may know that in France, open data is a legal obligation. That has been the case since uh, the law for Digital Republic was voted on. One of the big differences between France and Canada is the way we develop our laws. In Canada, when you have a problem, you try and resolve it as you can. And if you can't, you write a law. And it's the opposite in France. We write a law and afterwards we figure out how we can enforce it or apply it. About 4,000 municipalities in France since 2018 have legally been obliged to open their data in the public domain. This is true across many areas and it has applied to all cities with a certain population. And here we are, it's 2021. And there are about 600 public communities that have an open data portfolio. And here I'm showing you that only the very large communities today are succeeding in truly respecting this law when it comes to open data. The bigger cities are able to apply this law quite effectively, but if there are fewer than 100, a thousand people living in the community, and that is the case for many uh, villages and towns in France, they have more trouble doing so. It is a law, but there are no penalties if the law is not respected. Qualified people need to be recruited to oversee open data. And many of our leaders don't actually 
understand necessarily what is needed for open data. However, in the places where open data is regularly carried out, we are seeing a recent evolution that is uh, very concerning. Open data is not sufficient to improve the public sector's transparency. Citizens have more and more of their personal data shared. And uh, as you know, new ways to manage consent when it comes to personal information are needed as technology advances. But on the other hand, you also have private sector businesses and their information. For example, in the fight against climate change, there is, for example, data on emissions or data on the activities of their employees or data on their business activities. One of the issues is to define which data are, are of interest and then to determine who will be able to access them. I can give you an example of a project that we carried out in the west of France to define various categories of data. First, there is data created in the administration of the province, and then the data created by the businesses that work for that government administration. And it's very clear, the data created by businesses that carry out public administration duties or help the public administration carry out its duties do count as public data. And that means that they fall under the open data law in France. The other category that's interesting is data created by other administrations, but too often the administrations do not communicate very well amongst each other. Those data are also of general interest and therefore foster better cooperation between the different administrations. And thirdly, we have private data that have an impact on public data. For example, Airbnb in the tourism sector, telephone operators, and many others. So these are private data, and therefore in France, they do not fall under the open data law. So as it stands now, municipalities cannot go after Uber, for example, and ask for those data, much less publish that data as open data, as many cities would like to do. So partnerships are being created to come up with a framework to manage all of this. The rules and the ethics should be transparent and should properly separate private and public data. So Climate Data Hub is a project in the Loire area of France. And Climate Data Hub has been working for months to come up with the proper categorization. And in the Loire region, one of the steps is that uh, the different private data owners need to be identified, such as those working in agriculture, among so many others. And ethical principles also apply. For example, 
personal data must be protected. This goes for citizens, this goes for employees, and this goes for business secrets. Intellectual property must also be protected. Because open data doesn't mean that everyone needs to let go of their business model. The Data Governance Act is a very of great interest to the European Union. It is coming up with the notion of data altruism, which will manage the data that will be used in the general interest. This uh, Data Governance Act text will probably be adopted in 2022. That will be an important step for open data in the general interest. And we hope that it will make evolution of the model in France uh, possible. And that is what I wanted to talk to you about today. Thank you very much. Pour moi, c'est vraiment super intéressant de toujours voir un peu les perspectives dans différents pays parce qu'en fait, l'air de rien, euh, la plupart de ces éléments de partage de données sont beaucoup liés à la réglementation existante. Euh, et chaque réglementation au, au, au Canada, même chaque province, euh, puis le Québec, avec le fait qu'on n'est pas nécessairement sous le command law, on a tous bah, des, des variations, euh, des outils à disposition ou non et qui peuvent nous aider vraiment à, à réfléchir c'est quoi les différentes opportunités. Um, maintenant, uh, I'll turn to Jacqueline Liu. Um, after being the first director of data analytics at the New York City Department of Parks and Recreation, uh, she joined the Sidewalk Labs uh, initiatives as part of uh, director of digital integration, where she was piloting the integration of innovation objectives, uh, technologic policies, and ethics of data. Um, now she is a data lead at the Mozilla Foundation, but it's uh, on a project that she started as part of the of Sidewalk Labs, but that she is continuing, uh, the digital trust for places and routines that she will present. Um, it will explain us how transparency could uh, be uh, leveraged in order to have a better sense of how we collect and analyze the data. Uh, and for that, it will be interesting to see how it can be used uh, for, for the public interest. So, Jacqueline, it's up to you. Thank you um, so much for the introduction. Um, I think I'm just waiting for my slides to come up. Excellent. Um, so yeah, thank you for the for the great introduction. Um, my name, as mentioned, I'm excited to be sharing um, what we refer to as DTPR. It's an open source project that I started while I was at um, Sidewalk Labs in part to try to imagine how there can be better interfaces um, for digital systems and places for people. But um, as noted, my interest in this topic actually preceded my tenure at Sidewalk, um, as I had already been dealing with concerns around consent and notification, and in particular, the use of IoT in public spaces when I was in the public sector. 
at New York City Parks um, when we wanted to pilot some people counting benches in order to measure, um, you know, whether whether the investment to kind of create a new pedestrian bridge um, a, from Bronx from the borough of Manhattan to the Bronx um, was sort of reaping the the the, the returns um, that the city had um, hoped for. So um, the fundamental problem that the DTPR's open source standard tries to seeks to address um, is that digital is invisible in the built environment, but there's very little transparency about what is being collected by whom and for what purposes. And so why is this a problem? Um, this, this lack of transparency actually prevents a diverse set of people from understanding the role um, of digital technology um, in cities. Um, and I think especially in the COVID-19 sort of pandemic recovery context, and as well as the context of Black Lives Matter, especially in the United States, um, we are missing the opportunity to be able to leverage trusted um, tech to be able to safely reopen in community facilities and measure utilization or create um, real alternatives to um, removing sort of like human biases and human factors from traffic rule enforcement. Um, and as a consequence, um, urban technology is misunderstood and feels risky. And I think it prevents communities from reaping its benefits. Um, I am a technology optimist and I'm not, you know, excited to sort of think about how this is a potential sort of way forward. And I think I want to recognize that while in multiple jurisdictions um, there are there are regulations that extend privacy protection to the offline world. The mechanisms for notification and accountability are at best inconsistent, if not just absent. Any signage that does appear can be long paragraphs of text or small snippets that give little venue to follow up and ask more questions. Um, the belief that we sort of bring to our work is that people should be able to quickly understand how these digital technologies work and the purposes that they serve. And what exists in the world today is a bunch of um, ad hoc approaches. Um, and alternatively, we can sort of like allow for systematic implementation so that there can be shared learning so that people can kind of learn from one another in a meaningful way. And kind of the work here is about trying to find um, that better way. Um, and this is because through the research we've done um, and through through the project, um, what we found is that this fragmented approach to transparency actually contributes to this overall reduction um, in trust. And so we think about how, you know, what we're trying to seek here that people, why, why start with transparency? Fundamentally, transparency is the basis from which there can be accountability um, and that there can then be agent, people can have agency and through that agency um, actually begin to be able to trust um, the systems that work around them and, and actually, um, you know, affect the way the, the way the communities they live in and the societies they live in, um, how they work. Because this is um, unfortunately, you know, the reality <laughs> that has started to um, already set in. We are increasingly living inside a computer, um, and I think this is the useful prompt. Um, whether we are ready for a world where every pylon, bench, segment of sidewalk um, actually has a terms of service um, and a privacy policy associated with it, and so what is you know dtpr and so this is the kind of purpose of, of my talk um, it's an open source communication standard um, for transparency and accountability for digital technology in places um, it at its core it's a standard dictionary of concepts um, for those technology and data practices and an associated set of icons that express these concepts in a visual way um, this taxonomy of concepts would then build up um, expressly people legible description of sensors, systems and places that can then be made available to folks um, through a number of different 
mechanisms. Um, the inspiration for this is how you can go to an air, is a universal symbol set. You can go to any airport anywhere in the world and understand what that environment is doing for you, how to navigate it, how to use it, and how to um, be able to utilize it um, to suit your own purposes. And that is very much um, our aspiration. And so a quick um, kind of moment about how sort of DTPR was um, created. We initially sort of brought together a couple hundred of data and technology and privacy experts um, and experts in cities as well um, to identify the concepts that they felt were important for um, members of the public um, to understand. And then we um, took a design thinking approach to those inputs, um, refining those inputs through iterations of prototyping and user um, testing. It was um, key that that for us that we were putting um, the ideas of what a potential um, interface could be out in front of real people to get their feedback and then bringing that back to the contributors um, in, in an iterative cycle. And so this is um, what it looks like. It's this unified visual language that we believe is a critical starting point. Um, it works um, with digital tools that could help people um, follow up, uh, learn more and provide feedback. Um, and this is basically, you know, our goal is to, again, make the invisible tangible um, and that we believe that kind of advance, being able to advance, you know, place-based trust um, requires advancing these interoperable, legible, and what I kind of like to call system to people um, communication standards. Um, and so, yeah, I think this is just kind of where we are at. Um, currently, we are at this inflection point in our cities um, where technology is increasingly oblivious. Um, it, it, it's increasingly obvious, um, you know, all around us, but it, we're, we're largely oblivious um, to it. And so what we hope um, to offer here is one way for stakeholders from lots of different sectors um, to test and iterate on these initial ideas to try to find a shared um, path forward. And so how does implementing DTPR um, sort of support responsible data governance? Um, I think that when we think about prioritizing communication to the public around um, digital technologies, um, use of DTPR actually helps with internal processes um, to help make sure that information related to digital technology and IoT is always sort of um, public legible first and helps organizations sort of like build its use into their existing processes. So we're always sort of prioritizing sort of communication. Um, and so, and then through that shared language, that understanding um, that we would then be able to enable kind of like a, a broad understanding and legibility so that lots of different um, audience members can actually, or lots of um, different folks from different walks of life um, can actually uh, respond and react and provide feedback on, on these sorts of platforms. Um, and so here is a sort of field test um, that was in the in, <laughs> happened in the real world. Um, we in the summer last year we worked with the city of Boston to implement the DTPR system as part um, of a pilot project. And this is kind of what it looks like, um, the kind of which icons to put out in the built environment, the purpose, the type of technology, um, the QR code, which, which is a way to, for um, people to be able to learn more and provide feedback, and the logo of the accountable organization were all concepts and issues that sort of floated to the top through the user research as what people wanted to know in the moment about any particular um, data collection activity. And so this um, QR code actually works um, if folks um, in the audience want to take out their phone and turn on their camera and scan them, you can sort of mimic a little bit the experience um, yourself. Um, but this is sort of what um, that looks like. Um, this is the, you know, when you are brought to 
uh, the GIF is not working properly. Um, when you're brought to the QR code, you're brought to a web page where you're able to have the information sort of presented to you um, in a consistent way, moving consi from accountability to data type to data processing um, access um, and storage. And then I think importantly, um, these buttons kind of at the bottom allow the person and sort of invite feedback on the data, on the, on the use case itself. Um, and so we think the creation of these sorts of feedback loops are actually really critical um, to advancing responsible data governance more broadly. And so just um, to sort of like close um, in this in with, with this quote from from our partner, um, that investment in kind of communication tools and public processes is, is actually like a core part of um, being able to um, you know, advance responsible data governance in the public interest. It's, it's not possible, I believe, to really advance those principles um, unless everyone is able to come to the table and be part of that conversation. And we believe that having a shared language um, is a critical part of that. And um, yeah, so this is an application you can, uh, we are currently actually running an application process um, to launch um, our first sort of cohort and this is the website and um, thank you everyone I think for your time. Sur une infrastructure technologique qu'on peut mettre en place pour vraiment so uh, technological infrastructure that we could implement to help the public understand data collection. And we are also going to show how the data is going to be used afterwards. Our last presenter is Stéphane Roche. He is a professor in geomatics at Université Laval. He tries to un explain how the built world is organized and he also explains how the urban environment is shaped by humans. He uses open data, he encourages citizen participation, and he also tries to design smart environments. He was a member of the jury for the intelligent design at one of, an, one of the smart city design competitions. Stéphane, Go ahead. Hello, everyone. I'm very happy to be here today, and I'm also happy to be sharing, taking part in this virtual roundtable with such interesting people. I am going to talk really fast because I usually talk for way too long, and I usually run over time. So today I am going to talk really quickly. I am going to explain what I think we need to do to open things up successfully. I think we need to have open data and I need and I think that we should make the data available. Public organizations do that and that's what Jacques Priel explained in the first presentation, but we also need to open production to users too. Most of the information that is shared today and that's available on online platforms is data that is generated by users. So in English, we talk about crowdsourcing. In French, it's externalisation ouverte. But in my area for spe spatial studies, a lot of work has been done and people are trying to understand the mechanisms and the motivations of those who are of users who are starting to generate data. They want to study the quality of that data and they want to figure out whether that data is as good as the data produced by public organizations. It means that within a city, we can, we can evaluate how far we can open up the data, and we can also consider whether we should open up production to the general public. And this speaks to the 
challenges that Jacqueline mentioned earlier. So this means that we would have we would have 360 open data. I'm not going to elaborate too much, but I am going to try to summarize things. There were two experiences that I've had recently where I was able to apply these principles. First, there was the Ethics Commission from the Quebec government. It happened three or four years ago, and they were wondering about ethics and smart devices. They published a quick report, a short report. The title was Smart Cities for the Greater Good. They had philosophers and experts and lawyers and myself. They consulted us on these matters. And I was a member of the jury for the Smart City Challenge. And this is part of the reason why we are here today. It's because part of the activities, and not all of them, The city of Montreal has been developing projects that were based on these principles. So as members of the jury, we evaluated 150 letters of intent, and they applied to 200 different communities. We also studied the reports submitted by the 20 finalists. They had some very specific reports. and. That gave me an idea of how people wanted to tackle that challenge across the country. The people who created the challenge told them that they had to justify their proposals and they had to explain the needs, the need for that proposal for the general population. Therefore, the submissions had answers to these challenges, and their proposals had to tackle some very real challenges or obstacles, and they had to be justified by a citizen component. Data had to be at the center of the solution and not just technology. And for all of the proposals, there had to be openness and transparency in the way that the data was produced and published. And that was present in most proposals. So all of that made me think. I have been talking and working about working on smart cities, and I've been wondering how we could rethink not just the city's architecture and not just the built environment, but how we could reconceptualize the environment. How could we rethink the way that cities are organized and governed? I went through multiple iterations, and today this is the final version that I am now using. So this is the arch, the archway for smart cities. And yes, it is an interesting metaphor because the arch is only structurally sound when all of the components are together. So if one of the components is taken out, the entire archway crumbles. So this is what we've seen in multiple different examples. If we put, if we remove the citizenship aspect out of it, or if we take out any other component, we are going to end up with a project or an in initiative that will be too technocentric. But if instead we remove the digital aspect and the digital citizenship, then we might end up with a project or a solution or an initiative that will seem to work very well, but that will not meet some real needs. So to me, I, I reflected on the two experiences that I had, and this is how I came up with this archway. And we don't have a keystone 
But there, there is a name. So archways do have keystones, but to me, it's not really a keystone, but it's still a central part. So urban intelligence is very important because it helps organizations and cities understand what's happening on their territory. It helps them to understand it in a way that is relevant to the events that they are experiencing. And it also helps them to come up with solutions. Therefore, to me, urban intelligence, when it comes to smart cities, is based on multiple elements. And one of the elements, and of course, I did not put them in any particular order, but but learning is important because it's important to go back and read what previous urbanists had to say about how cities are designed and how to build smart cities. These cities would give opportunities to learn. And Jacqueline's example is one of one such example because it enables people to learn and it also helps them to participate well, with full knowledge of what's happening. It's important to mobilize technology and it's important to take advantage of the technological progresses, but we also need to take but we also need to take the human aspect into consideration. There's also a new way of thinking about digital citizenship. Inclusion is also really important. Inclusion was mentioned by the two previous speakers. There is no urban intelligence without inclusion. Inclusion means, it means making sure that no one is excluded from new initiatives. And when we talk about producing data or releasing data, well, the topics at hand today, uh, some cities and some maps have dead zones. Some areas are not well served by data. And it's not just related to the digital divide, but it's also because strategically some areas are less well documented. And when they're not well documented, then we end up having urban governance that is based on data. So, so as Jacqueline mentioned, some areas use data, but sometimes if people cannot participate, then there can be some inclusion in some territories. The resiliency dimension is very important. And in the Smart City Challenge, uh, this was very clear. A lot of challenges that were brought forward by the cities uh, were related to um, Anthropocene uh, uh, urban development because we can't uh, think about uh, urban organization and urban development without taking into account uh, uh, great transformations like uh, climate change, uh, energy transition, etc. And there is the smart dimension. Some colleagues have various translations in French for smart, but it's a dimension in the city that lets us take advantage of all the new technologies, including uh, human sensors that give um, uh, flexibility. And the example is the platform that was presented by Jacqueline and its application. And finally, openness, which comes back to what I was saying earlier. It's, op it, it's not just open data, but it's also 
the transparency of uh, processes, including uh, the process of uh, producing data. So I will end uh, quickly. I just want to remind you that this model is very conceptual, theoretical, even if it is based on a lot of empirical data. But uh, like Jacqueline, I am a technological optimist, but I am not totally naive, and there, I know there are issues. And Jacques and Jacqueline and myself, we didn't talk a lot before, but the, the issues are those that they already mentioned, that is standardization, not in the sense of leveling, but if we want this uh, vir the circle to be uh, virtual, this uh, this uh, circle of openness, we have to ensure uh, interoperability, and that's uh, what Jacques uh, was uh, talking about, uh, about the data infrastructure in the Loire, uh, where these elements are important. Then there's the issue of metadata, that's a, ma a major item when we want to open the uh, data production processes. There's also the issue of quality, of uncertainty, which were mentioned, uh, confidence, which is major, the uh, risk management. And in my view, in the context where data becomes a lever, Uh, economical, social, legal lever, uh, risk have to be managed uh, regarding the use of the data, their transformation, but also in the production. And at uh, Laval University, we offer a course on quality and uh, uh, risk management surrounding data production and use. And as Jacques mentioned earlier, we don't have a legal framework in Canada or in Quebec, which is uh, formal, but we do have uh, jurisprudence, which is abundant and shows that uh, data producers are always responsible Uh, uh, despite all of the precautions they may take explicitly, ex explicitly when they open data. So some producers, uh, especially public producers of data, uh, are sometimes reluctant to open their data. So I will end there because I've spoken long enough and I, re I thank you all. And uh, I return the mic to Stefan. et d'avoir différents points de vue. Le point de vue de Jacques qui nous parle beaucoup euh, des infrastructures à la fois... I think it's interesting to see the different point of view. Uh, the interpreter um, uh, would like you to know that uh, the quality of the sound is insufficient to allow me to interpret. Euh, et enfin, bah, la, pr la, présentation de, la présentation de Stéphane, euh, qui nous amène un peu la réflexion de c'est quoi le, bah, les infrastructures sociales et c'est quoi le, les éléments que les, 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 les résidents, les citoyens peuvent jouer là-dedans euh, avec cette clé de voûte, un peu cette arche et la, la clé de voûte qui est en haut, qui est vraiment de dire bah c'est pas juste, c'est pas juste les décisions légales, c'est pas juste les infrastructures techn technologiques, c'est aussi comment on amène l'ensemble de la réflexion. Euh, auprès du grand public et d'être capable que chacun ait un peu un rôle là-dedans. Euh, avant de passer aux questions, euh, je vais avoir une mini question, je vous demande en 30 secondes, une minute chacun de bien vouloir répondre. Euh, si vous avez aujourd'hui un, un appel à faire, un call to action, 
euh, aux, aux décideurs publics, aux personnes qui ont un rôle à jouer au niveau des villes, au niveau des gouvernements, euh, sur justement comment est-ce qu'ils peuvent rendre la donnée un peu plus euh, au service du, 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 de l'intérêt commun, euh, quel serait ce call to action Donc, on peut commencer par, par Jacques, euh, si tu veux bien. Ben, écoute, euh, merci Stéphane. Pour Thank répondre... you, Stéphane. And to répond, to answer very uh, succinctly, the first thing I would say to a public authority is to look at uh, creating a framework to use uh, open data. That is the first element, but there are also private data, which is of general interest. There is also the issue of uh, people's uh, private data uh, to engage in transformation. So we need a global approach. So in one sentence, my advice would be that to have an impact, the use of data uh, rests on cooperation. Open data is a first stone, but we need cooperation strategies. My advice would be um, that to have I'm an sorry, impact. can you repeat the uh, question? <laughs> If, if, if you had, um, if you had, uh, uh, sorry, it's also the tor the translation is also freezing my, my brain. Um, so if, if, you, if you had a call to action uh, for uh, policymakers and leaders on how to make data, um, you know, in the public interest, how to use data in the public interest, what would it be? Yeah, I mean, I think I, I spoke to it a little bit um, in in my talk, which is that, you know, we have we have a toolkit, we have a prototype that's kind of tested was developed by experts um, and kind of together with um, the public. So I would sort of urge folks to and organizations to, um, you know, see how they might be able to think about even performing small tests and, and bringing that sort of interaction and that sort of engagement and legibility to their um, data collection um, proposals. I think that's not, you know, I think my experience has been that, um, you know, the public dialogue is hard um, and but it's hard because there isn't a basis for shared understanding and legibility. There is a fundamental information asymmetry or sort of like lopsided <laughs> information um, that prevent that sort of really hinders the dialogue. And so if we can just establish that basis of um, communicating sort of what a thing is, who's accountable, what do we think um, the benefits are, my hope is that um, we will then be able to learn from each other what responsible data governance, like the structures and the frameworks and the policies might actually need to look like, because then at least we're all having the same conversation. That's a slightly long-winded answer, but... <laughs> good, Jacqueline. Thank you. Uh, Stéphane? Bah, deux, uh, deux points. Uh, two, education. two points. Education and uh, to give the example, since uh, this is for political uh, decision makers, if we want open data to be uh, useful and used, they have to be available and accessible, but uh, also if, uh, potential users must have the capacity to use them, which is not always the case. And uh, the pandemic showed us that our decision makers are not very good, where they had a unique and ideal uh, uh, opportunity to formulate and justify difficult uh, decision uh, based on uh, on data, but they didn't do it. Uh, Stefan, you did it a lot on social media, but I think education and giving a good example, uh, showing how data is useful to understand complex uh, phenomena since uh, we live in a world that is more and more complex. Thank you, Stefan. 
les projets sont, elles sont pas mal dirigées vers ce moment là yeah. I'll start with you, Jacqueline. Uh, so in the pilots that you've done so far, you've seen, uh, have you seen any evidence that the standard can actually help increase trust in our digital environment? And what are some of the results that you've seen so far? Yeah, so um, thank you for, for, for that question. Um, I think the qualifier is that when we did the pilot in Boston, it was incredibly limited and very small. <laughs> it was just for a sort of like one set of sensors at a couple of intersections. Um, and we launched it in the early days of COVID. So I think that's like the sort of like fundamental limitations. There were not not a lot of pedestrian activity, not a lot of sort of like engagement, people being interested, um, being out and about. So those are sort of like a fundamental limitation of, of the work we did in Boston. But I think we learned a lot about um, what it takes to be organizationally ready <laughs> to support a conversation like this. So I think from that uh, measure, it was a success. Um, what we do know about trust um, is sort Sort of comes from the, the user research, um, the design-centric sort of user research that we did. And what we found is that trust is enabled from an understanding of what the technology is actually doing. When the benefit people needed to be able to understand, and, and they, they had a sort of like rubric where they wanted to understand the benefit of the data collection and be able to assess whether it was greater than the perceived risk. And if the benefit of the data collection was understood to be greater than the perceived risk, then people felt that the technology was worth um, exploring. And in particular, um, the folks in our kind of longitudinal study viewed beneficial data collection as serving a social purpose that would resonate with their um, worldviews and their belief systems. Um, specifically, what we found when we kind of dug into this um, trust in technology around data collection was dependent primarily on three things. And this is what you see reflected in the signage design. So who, which entity is responsible and accountable, what, what kind of data is being collected, and why, to what end and purpose. And when we continued to sort of advance the design research, what we found was that trust really substantively increased when the benefits and the outcomes were communicated specifically. So for example, this smart traffic signal increased crossing times 50 times in the past week to allow a pedestrian to cross safely because their walking speed was low. This really helped people understand the tangible benefits and in the end, you know, support the use of the technology because they could immediately map the um, outcomes of the data processing to their um, immediate experience. And so I think about this in the context of um, open data sometimes, and it's just kind of like one of the challenges of open data has been that the data is transparent, it's available, but the decision-making processes and the systems that that data feeds is not legible and it's not apparent. Um, and so I think this is just um, thinking about urban intel, <laughs> the, the um, framework that Stefan had put forward, um, I really see that sort of this sort of, not just clarity around the data um, activity, but clarity around the whole set of systems that um, rely on that data processing um, as sort of a key part of, of advancing responsible data governance. Thank you, Jacqueline, very clear. Uh, next question for Jacques in French. Comment est-ce qu'on peut envisager le rôle des collectivités locales dans les organismes altruistes de données dont tu parlais qui seront bientôt inscrits dans la loi en France? Et comment peut-on définir le bien commun à une échelle locale Deux minutes, Jacques, pour laisser la place à la dernière question. Alors, sur la place des collectivités locales, c'est une grande question parce que la oh, définition… C'est une question importante parce que la définition du gouvernement de the, the, uh, definition of the European government est a, a third party, an independent third party, who will be responsible of managing the data, and it's not the local community who will do that. And it's not the debate that we're having in the um, inclusion of this model in uh, European law. So we have to define what is a common good. And I think that the common good could be defined collectively 
with the users, uh, uh, with the public sector and all interveners. Uh, second, if the subject has to be well identified at a specific moment, uh, since uh, there are lesser restrictions in France, uh, we have uh, cycling uh, paths and uh, the routes that, that uh, people take with uh, their bikes are very important to include these uh, new uh, pathways for cyclists. We, we, we can't uh, gather that uh, data uh, permanently. That would be dangerous for, pro for private uh, uh, data. Shall I answer in French or in English? Because you asked it in English. So in French, it'll be easier for me. Yes. I think so. It seems to me uh, it, the way it was thought of was aligned on the issue of uh, uh, sustainable development, specifically of the urban environments, uh, which are undergoing a lot of transformations, the issue of education, of resiliency, of uh, flexibility, of finding new solutions to improve uh, uh, the intelligence is uh, anchored in the 21st century uh, competencies, uh, which uh, uh, which are geared to solving complex issues. Uh, the uh, problems we are facing are uh, more complex uh, than ever with the transformations that are happening much more quickly than in the past. Uh, and that's an important element, that's why this uh, in capacity to readapt is essential, essential for the environment and for people. Merci encore à vous trois et bonne journée. Merci à toi, Stéphane, puis merci à vous. Thank you, Stéphane. And thank you to Jacques and Jacqueline. Bye.